I hope that everyone is feeling awake after that <laughs> a little bit alarming noise. Um, <laughs> Helen Scott is the CEO of the Canadian Partnership for Women and Children's Health. And I know she just wanted to say a few remarks before we get started this morning. Hi, thanks, Megan. And I actually just came from a Rotary Club um, event where I was doing a presentation, but they meet at seven o'clock in the morning and they start, there are like a hundred people in the room, they start with exercises. So <laughs> it's like way to get up and up and at it. So it was kind of like that little uh, alarm sound to get us all alert. Um, I look forward to the day when everyone joins Zoom calls with their video on so we can actually see see you because some of you I haven't seen in, in quite some time having just returned after being off and uh, it is wonderful to see some of your, your faces, those of you who can see and to see the names of the others. Um, it's been a long time and it's great to be connected in this virtual space. So I was actually going to open with just a few remarks about what CatWatch is but um, recognizing almost all of the names on the call. I um, I think I'm gonna, oh, there's a few new, new names. I'm just going to just really quickly summarize who we are. So the Canadian Partnership for Women and Children's Health, which I have the honor of um, working at and being the leader of, is an organization that is an association of about 100 Canadian member organizations. These organizations, as most of you know, are NGOs who deliver health programming. They are uh, health programming and do stakeholder engagement work. They're academic institutions, universities across Canada, and health professional associations. So the Canadian Association of Midwives, the Canadian um, uh, Society of Obstetricians and Gynecologists of Canada, and those kinds of organizations. So it's kind of unique in that we bring together organizations across sectors and across different ways of working under the same umbrella with the same mission of improving the lives of women and children. And we work in three main ways. So the first is looking to improve the capacity to generate evidence for the work that we do around measuring results. So if you have a chance, I encourage you to visit our Project Explorer, which has over 600, or sorry, almost 600 uh, Canadian women and children's health and gender equality projects listed. We, that's our first pillar of work. The second area of work that we engage in, um, which is led by Andy, who I see is on the call here, Andy Craig, uh, and soon to be led by Jide as well, who I see has just joined us. Welcome Jide, a new member of the CamWatch team. Um, and, and under our knowledge exchange pillar, we look to bring Canadians together to connect them, um, to share resources, to share information, to share evidence, this example, uh, this activity is an example of the kind of work that we like to do, bringing Canadians together from coast to coast to coast to kind of share what we know and amplify and, and uh, extend the work that we're all doing. And the last strategic pillar is stakeholder engagement, which is really why we're all here, because we know how important it is that key stakeholders, for example, uh, politicians and the government really understand the value and implications of their investments and of the work that we do and their leadership around um, women and children's health. And you would have seen some success in that area from CamWatch, the CamWatch membership more broadly and some key sector colleagues with the Thrive Agenda and the Prime Minister's recent announcement. Um, and now we're entering a new period as we go into the election period and then we don't know what will, what will follow after that. So with that introduction, I turn it back to you, Megan. Thank you so much, Helen. Uh, just a few housekeeping matters before we really dive in. Um, the webinar was set up so that everyone was muted upon entry, and we just ask uh, to make sure that we limit any feedback or background noise that you stay on mute. There will be a few uh, question periods immediately following each speaker. So if you'd like to speak as Leah, um, typed in the chat box on the bottom left hand corner there's like a little microphone and it's the mute unmute button so if you'd like to speak uh, please don't hesitate um, to unmute yourself and speak during those periods also feel free as uh, speakers are delivering their remarks to post any questions during the chat box and we'll be sure to flip back and forth um, and also just I uh, would like to offer a very warm welcome to our three speakers today. Uh, we have first uh, 
uh, Lauren Liu, who was the Member of Parliament for Riviere de Mille uh, from 2011 to 2015. Uh, so excited, especially in this period, to have her with us. Um, she was the youngest woman elected to the House of Commons in Canadian history. Um, Lauren is also a familiar face to uh, some or many of us because she currently is working with WaterAid based in New York City as their advocacy coordinator. We also have another uh, person who's no stranger to those who attend any event ever in Ottawa, and that's Neha Berry. Uh, she's the Parliamentary Officer with Results Canada um, and just a government relations guru. She will be providing us with a quick overview of the broader election process, as well as the really fabulous toolkit that Results Canada has developed. Uh, and then thirdly, uh, we're also so excited to welcome Gwyneth Sedig. Uh, who's an associate with Miller Thompson's tax practice group based in Kitchener Waterloo and she primarily focuses on social impact. Uh, she recently co-authored an article entitled updates to the Canada Elections Act impact on nonprofits and charities. Um, it's a really fabulous uh, easy to read, easy to digest um, resource. I'll be sure to um, post the link. And then, of course, we have um, another person who I'm sure many of us know well, uh, who's going to help facilitate today's session, and that's Taryn Russell, the Campaigns Director with Results Canada. Uh, she's also the co-chair of Ken Watch's Stakeholder Engagement and Policy Working Group, and she'll be uh, moderating the question and answer periods. And without further ado, uh, Lauren, I'd like to turn it over to you. Great, thanks Megan. Um, hi everybody, it's really good to be here and really glad to be a uh, part of this virtual space with you. Um, elections are really exciting times. I personally have loved them since I was 16 and went door knocking on my first uh, elections. So um, they can be really great moments to be part of our democracy and um, just to speak to our fellow Canadians about what uh, is important to us. So I personally love it um, and I hope you will too, or at least enjoy this one. Um, I do have a bit of a PowerPoint um, or a few slides. So I'm not sure if we could share the screen, um, but if not, that's also fine. Awesome. Um, so I, just a little bit about, um, by means of introduction, I was elected in 2011 as part of the Orange Wave um, at the age of 20. So elected a little bit uh, by surprise, and during the four years I served in Parliament, I served as Deputy Critic for Environment, um, International Trade, and Science and Technology, and also sat on um, the Foreign Affairs Committee as well as the National Resources Committee, um, and a few other ones. And and so um, as an MP, I uh, realized that, um, or there was, like many new MPs, um, a very large um, learning curve. And uh, advocacy groups and civil society groups are really instrumental and really crucial to helping me learn what I needed to know to uh, do my job properly in Parliament and as well um, as an advocate around the country. So I strongly believe in um, the power of advocacy and um, just its use in informing smart public policy and public policy that's based on evidence. Um, so I'm not sure if you have access to my screen, but it's completely fine if not. Um, so <laughs> so I think you can share a screen if you just go down to the little box that's green has a green uh, box with an arrow and then just hit share there and you should be able to share it. Excellent. I hope that worked. Now we can see it. Excellent, thank you. Um, so I think many, we all do advocacy in different ways and um, I think there are different uh, activities that can lead to success depending on the context. Um, but I think one big takeaway from what an advocacy relationship should be is that an advocacy relationship is really a give and take relationship. Um, so I think that uh, looking at building relationships um, with candidates and with politicians, um, you know, groups really have to look at what they offer and uh, really see it as a 
sort of conversation as opposed to a transactional um, interaction. So in the policy realm, uh, there are a few different ways in which advocacy groups add a lot of value, um, providing evidence in mobilizing, mobilizing supporters and as uh, serving as trusted validators. Um, and so one very valuable way in which we drew an advocacy and expertise um, in the policymaking space as the official opposition was in um, drawing talking points and evidence and bring, bringing that into debate in the House of Commons or um, having you know groups feed us ideas and topics for questions during question period. And those are sort of um, inputs and information that you get from, that we receive from maintaining sort of ongoing uh, sustained relationships as opposed to sort of these one-off um, interactions. So, um, that was really crucial. Um, I think in terms of the basics of, uh, of uh, being involved in elections, these are all things that you're likely very aware of. Um, so first of all, the election is a relationship building opportunity. So um, time is very tight and candidates likely won't have a lot of time to speak to you. Um, so do manage expectations, don't expect to break through right away, and um, do know that after the elections, um, there will be likely a chance to follow up in which you will have a much more ch better chance of holding their attention and um, really getting your message through. Um, it's likely um, better to focus on key writings and writings in which there are star candidates or um, you know, rising rising stars, as well as writings in which you have a lot of support. Um, but it's really important in order to break through to find an angle that is um, important to the candidates in uh, in that given writing. So try to find a local, personal, or political angle, and um, that will make your message much more effective. Um, another big Thing to keep in mind is that your supporters, especially during election time, are really your biggest assets because your supporters are the constituents. Um, and so um, on top of looking, seeing elections as a milestone in your relationship building with decision makers, it can also be a really great milestone um, in terms of keeping your supporters informed and engaged and feeding them the information they need to ultimately make an informed decision uh, as voters in, during the election. And um, finally, uh, be ready with a post-election plan. Um, you can use your findings from election to inform conversations with newly elected members. Um, getting to know people's priorities during the election can help you tailor and shape your messages to become uh, more effective and uh, more compelling. Um, but do uh, gather as much information as possible uh, during these conversations with local candidates. So just some ideas, and I'm sure um, those uh, during the toolkit or you may have other ones, um, but one very effective campaign strategy could be to launch an online campaign uh, focused on this building. So focused on um, getting gaining more supporters um, that can be mobilized after the campaign and building a larger constituency. Um, Another idea is to send a survey to all parties and to publish the results of the survey, again, as a way of engaging and informing um, your supporters and constituents. Um, and another thing that, another activity that um, is quite common during election time is to publish a report card for all parties and candidates. And I'm not sure if that's already in, in the works, but that can be a really great way of um, also creating something, um, a, a, a piece of, an item that you can send to your uh, supporters and engage them through the election period. Um, Obtaining earned media could be a bit more difficult, um, seeing as it's a busy time. Um, UNGA is coming up this month as well, um, and there are lots of other issues crowding up the space, um, but it's also another alternative, um, and uh, 
can be very effective, especially if they appear in local in uh, local papers and if again there is a, a local aspect um, to the story or a local angle. Um, so all in all, I think. Um, Uh, the value of, I think the value of engaging in elections is really to, uh, you know, show that you can be a trusted partner and um, start building building a relationship that can become a give and take relationship. Um, but um, I found that I wouldn't have been able to uh, really learn the ropes as a new MP without the help of advocacy groups and. Um, that's really crucial to being able to uh, carry out my role. So um, that is, that's it um, in terms of sort of the ideas that I wanted to uh, share, but I suppose we can open up the floor to some questions and answers if there's any comments. Thanks so much, Lauren. Um, and as I mentioned, there is a chat box. So if you don't have a microphone, you can always write your question in there or just unmute yourself and um, feel free to ask Lauren and pick her brain because she has lots of great experience she can share with us. And while people are thinking, I might start with a question. Do you remember from a time when you were in P and advocacy strategy that really st stuck out to you or something that you were like, oh, okay, yeah, they're doing a great job at this. Or this really stood out from kind of all the asks you got on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, that's a great question. I do remember as an MP, um, I think that it's really important to remember that people tend to be social learners. Um, and so I really found that the one-on-one -on -one conversations and the lobby days and being able to speak to people one-on-one -on -one was much more uh, effective than sending, than receiving correspondence or receiving a report or a policy brief um, that I as a uh, wouldn't necessarily, might not have time to uh, read carefully or might not assimilate as well as I would, um, sort of a one-on-one -on -one conversation. So um, while those sort of uh, products are really important to supplement advocacy work, I think there's nothing that replaces face-to-face uh, -face interaction. I'll jump in with a question if I, I can't see hands, but interested to know so we did a fair bit of um advocacy work over the last year and we would often our instinct when we met with a member of parliament or a minister was to have these like round tables with 8 10 12 14 sometimes 16 people um and that seemed to get us in the door to get the meeting uh but then the conversation and the ability to really meaningfully go in depth on things um, is limited when you, it takes half an hour to do introductions um, because you have so many people sitting around the table. So I wonder if you had any comments on that, like um, getting in, how to get in the door, but also balance and have those meaningful conversations um, with MPs so you can actually, you know, grow their knowledge base and whatnot. Um, that's a great question, and I think there are a few a few different um, ways to do that. Um, maybe I'll talk about three examples that I can think of. Um, one might be one example would be sort of an interparty caucus, um, and so a few of those exist. Um, there was one that was um, an all-party uh, group on climate change. Um, another on, I believe, ocean ocean health, um, run by Finn Donnelly and. Um, others as well. And so forming those inter-party groups was sort of a helpful way to hold briefings that were specifically targeted to MPs that had a stake in the issue or a particular interest. Um, and you can, generally it's a bit easier to go into depth on those issues and, um, you know, depending on the relationships that those MPs happen to have with each other might be a way for having some sort of a, a cross-party initiative um, or movement for an issue. Um, another, I think, in might be to, um, you know, target certain MPs to table legislation that has been sort of prepared and um, researched and uh, behind which there is an existing constituency, um, because I think once you find one MP that can be a champion for an issue um, through a motion, private member's bill, or um, 
uh, another activity, a committee study, for example, um, that makes it much more effective and that MP can then mobilize their colleagues, um, organize, you know, parliamentary briefings, for example, breakfast briefings, uh, organize round tables. Um, and that gives the issue a bit more direction um, and a bit more urgency when there is an ask on the table. Um, and then finally, um, you can also uh, organize sort of one-off breakfast briefings and one-off reception events. Um, but as you sort of point out, those tend to be a bit more shallow um, and it's a bit harder to get into deep conversation, but it does um, end up reaching, I guess, a wider, um, a broader number of MPs who kind of can pop in and show up to show up to uh, demonstrate their support, but might not be, might not stay for um, a longer 30 minute conversation. Um, but those events are sort of great to pair with lobby days where you do schedule um, desk side briefings for MPs one on one. That's great, thank you. Any other questions before we move on? Okay, if you think of one later, feel free to write it in the chat box and we all might have more time, um, but I'm gonna pass it over to my colleague Neha now. Hi everyone, hopefully you guys can hear me. Thank you so much for having me and um, thank you so much Lauren for your insight. That's really great. And as a former staffer, I can certainly say I really enjoyed working with really intelligent young women like yourself. So that's really great. Um, for those who may not know, my name is Neha and I am the Parliamentary Affairs Manager here at Results Canada. I know most of you probably know who Results is, but just in case some of you are new, um, we basically are an organization that generates the political will to end extreme poverty. We work with citizen advocates across the country and they are encouraged to talk with decision makers about the health around the world and education. And because of them, we've been able to leverage millions of dollars for programs and policies that will help people all around the world. So it's really great that I get to work for an organiza organization that does this kind of work and certainly lines up with my experience on Parliament Hill. Um, we focused a lot on um, helping Canadians from all across the country to focus on working with their members of parliament. And part of that really important work is also recognizing that we are also Canadians and that it's really important that even though we work a nine to five job in, in many of the sector, that we also engage with our own members of parliament. So part of this is kind of showing you a toolkit that we've produced that kind of um, touches upon um, some of the questions that Tara and I have gotten over the past two years around Canadian aid and kind of the reoccurring questions that we got from MPs um, throughout this time. And we hopefully think that it covers enough of the information that we've gathered to help Canadians kind of speak to their MP in a very basic way that can um, try to encourage the work that we do. So I really wanted to share that with you and spend most of the time going through it. So I'm also just gonna share my screen really quick. So on our website, you can see below, we have the election toolkit here. You can just click get started. So this is our election toolkit. We're on the home page. And really this is just talking about why it's important to use your voice during an election period. So we know that um, just yesterday, the writ was dropped, which means officially now the election campaign has started, which is really exciting. Tonight we have our first candidates debate, some leaders, may or may not be there, but I think it'll still be interesting to hear what's going on and to, to get a gauge of what's on top of mind for Canadians this election. Um, we have some information here. So again, like using your voice, it's really powerful. We have a video for you. And at the bottom here, we have the days, hours, and minutes until the polls close, which I feel is like embedded in my brain all the time. So there it is for you guys to see. And then at the bottom, it's just emphasizing the fact that we are a nonpartisan organization, which I think is really important for our work and keeps us honest. So I really um, just wanted to emphasize that as well. So this is page one. If you click on to continue to step one, we have um, this information about why to participate. So again, it's election time. I know we kind of understand the basics of why it's important, but I think it's really great for us to always um, emphasize the fact that this is the election process that, you know, that we have, uh, 
like a duty to be able to speak about the issues that matter to us the most. And I think that it's really great that we try to get family involved and friends involved to make sure that they understand that this is something that they need to pay attention to. And that really MPs work for us. And that's really important for, for you to understand that it's not just about them getting our votes, but it's also making them work hard for our vote and to understand that they are the representatives for us in Ottawa. So we have some information on that. We talk about how to start. So really the first thing you wanna do is figure out who your MP is and who your candidates are. So to see that, I'm sure many of you have already seen kind of lawn signs in your area. Um, you might also be able to just do a quick Google search, but all that information is there for you to kind of figure out who to, to get in touch with. And obviously there's different ways to get in touch with them. You can pop into their campaign office, you can phone them, you can email them. We have, we have social media as well, but I'll get into more of that a little bit later. Um, and really a big thing what we wanna do is wanna educate our candidates on the issues that we care about. And of course, it's always fun when you bring some friends with you because there's power in numbers. And I think that when we try to meet with people or show that these are issues that matter to us, the more people we have with us, the better. So we ask that you bring your family and friends to join you. We do have a call to action every month, which um, you can click here, but it basically gives you specific ideas of actions you can take each month to help um, push along the campaign of Canadian aid in this case. So I'll click on to the second step. Really, this entire page is pretty much about educating your candidate on the issue. So we have a little bit of information here on Canadian aid, and um, it has been switched now from 0.28, so that's just a slight change. But nonetheless, it's really important to talk about why Canadian aid matters and why Canadians are talking about it. We have a video here for you as well, because I know some people are visual learners as well. And then we have these kind of four main components of what we thought really useful to know. So we have the 10 things to know about Canadian aid. Again, we pretty much just took like top line kind of ideas of how Canadian aid is effective, why majority Canadians support it, very fact-based, which is great, how it's feminist, how it combats climate change. Again, thinking of those top line issues for the selection and how our issues fit into that. So hopefully we did some of the thinking for you, but of course you're able to add your own spin to it or see the angles you like. And when you start kind of doing some research of your candidates, you might be able to kind of pluck the ones that make the most sense for your, for your candidates. So there is some stuff on economic growth, et cetera. So that's really cool information. Of course, everything is cited below and in a PDF format for those who want to print it. So we have some political party history on Canadian aid. We thought this would be really useful just to get very top line, but just talking a little bit about historically what each party has done, uh, each major party has done on the issue and how you can, again, whether or not you just use your own briefing or maybe you want to highlight this to your candidate, but it's good information to have on hand. So I think that would be something for you guys to read up on. We have the positive impact of Canadian aid. So with results, we focus a lot on tuberculosis and nutrition, et cetera. So we're just showing some of the key issues we focus on and how it kind of fits into Canadian aid and the importance of it. So again, just more background information, but certainly interesting for those who work on these issues. And then of course, keeping in mind with everything that's going on this election time, as many of you know, there's kind of key issues that come up, but how aid fits into that. So we talk about the economy, we talk about women, climate change, uh, migration. So all really great information. Again, that's stuff that keeps coming up during the election period. But again, how our issues fit into that. So we're kind of meeting them halfway and hopefully you can find this um, kind of point system easy enough for you guys to be able to to educate your candidates. Lastly, we have some quizzes here we can click on, which is kind of a fun take that we've been doing throughout the, the election for the past summer months. And it's been really fun, but you can see it there by all means, take a look, it's just friendly and fun to kind of do and get your knowledge on what's been happening during this election period. We have um, this now, the third step is actually meeting with your candidate. So hopefully you've done some research, you know who they are, you've prepped yourself, you've educated yourself. And now we have, let's start to take some action. So we wanna meet with your candidate. We have some already pre-drafted email for you to reach out to them, a meeting outline suggestion. We have a leave behind, so generic enough for all parties, you can just print and hand it to them. And of course, a thank you after you've met with them. So just really hopefully simple enough for you guys to use, but of course you don't have to use it just as an outline. 
Um, of course, let us know if you've done any of this work because it really helps um, for us to kind of build our own strategy around it. And I know that sometimes you've had an MP for a long time that kind of wins over and over again and people always feel like, you know, why do we even bother engaging with the other candidates, which I hear often enough. I think there is something to be said about when you're meeting with candidates, even if you know that they may not win or your MP always wins like every 50 years. I think it's really great for you to kind of get a feed into the party as well, right? Because as candidates, they go on weekly um, or monthly calls with people within their area, if like a certain MP is in charge of kind of keeping in touch with Southwestern Ontario or whatever it is. Um, it's really great for them to hear like, hey, we met with so-and-so, this is kind of something that's come up. And then other candidates are like, yes, actually that the same organization met with us as well. Kind of feeds into the system. And then hopefully if they don't have their talking points on this, they're trying to probably ask for that. And we'll, we're able to kind of feed into it, hear a sense of language, what they're saying, what's their main issue, and how we can kind of fit into that come whatever government is elected at the time. So I think nothing's really a lost case and everything is always worth your time. It's just a matter of um, making sure that you're just putting in that effort with, with the top, I would say probably top two candidates, but of course the best case would be all, all of your candidates. We also thought that it would be fun to have some sample questions for your local candidates, which is one of my favorite things during a long time. I love my local candidates debates, but um, just sample questions for you to kind of ask while all your candidates are together in one room and kind of hold them accountable for some of those things. And then just information for those who may not know how to vote, but what you need. And of course, for new voters as well. We have um, some sample social media kind of tweets already pre-done for you but mostly just as a thank you for meeting with people or hearing what they have to say of course you don't have to follow it but just kind of giving that to you already with some social media shareables so always fun imaging that we can do and then as we mentioned before and lauren had mentioned as well as getting published this is a big thing that results focuses on so we talk about op-eds and letters to the editor, which we're very proud to do and often have been very successful in. And so I think we talk a little bit about how we guide you through that and what kind of tips and tricks you can do for that. So certainly look at that. And then um, we have the, you can request for an iCare card, which we've been focusing on. So sending those cards into the prime minister. And then as well, um, you can put a Canadian flag patch or pin on a backpack and take a photo. So just some fun different ways to interact, but mostly just keeping the excitement going until October 21st. And lastly, again, this was kind of based off of questions that we received from MPs throughout the past two years, but um, some frequently asked questions. So if you can drop down, I'm not going to go through each of them, but just kind of give you a sense of what are the, some of the main issues we've been focusing on. So what kinds of activities are funded by Canadian aid? When you hear that, what does that mean? Um, how much does Canada actually spend on Canadian aid? We have how much should countries spend on aid and what countries are currently reaching their targets? So that's often what a lot of um, candidates are asking. We have, I'm worried we are focusing too much on women and girls when it comes to Canadian aid. What about the boys? Um, we've heard that from some MPs as well. So we wanted to address some of those issues. We have a big one, which we received in the past couple of months is what role does Canadian aid play in the response to climate change? Very interesting aspects to that. We also have um, which is a good one here. The federal budget is not currently balanced, so we shouldn't spend any more on Canadian aid or increase our contributions to development institutions such as the Global Fund, etc. Um, what happens if we leave current aid levels as is? So again, just kind of timely off of what we've been hearing from other um, candidates and then of course has the latest investment of 1.4 billion from the Canadian government increased aid budget. So very general comments and questions. Of course, if these are questions that you're hearing different or you've met with your candidates or your um, organizations have, you can always feel free to reach out to us. I've been kind of thinking through the eyes of a candidate and seeing what kind of questions they might ask. But we tried to cover as much as we could here, but essentially that's really it for the toolkit. And we hopefully think that you guys can use it as a resource. Feel free to share it, or um, if you have any questions, please let us know. And just to follow up on uh, Neha, first of all, thanks so much for walking through this absolutely amazing toolkit. I think it's such a, 
it's an incredible piece of work and it's super helpful, I think, to all of us who are working collaboratively in, um, in this work. I also just wanted to let everyone uh, who's on the, this webinar know that CanWatch is also developing some sort of complementary content to, um, to the results toolkit that will also provide um, some shareables, um, and some suggested content that's very specific to Canadian leadership in, in global health. Um, so we'll be sending that to CanWatch members next week. And over to you, Taryn, for any questions. Sure. Does anybody have any questions? Um, I would just, uh, maybe I'll just add too. So the toolkit we developed is intended for grassroots Canadians. So maybe yourselves, but I know a lot of you also work for organizations. So are curious probably around how can I engage as an organization? I think a lot of the toolkit can be transferable to that. But maybe Neha, did you want to touch a little bit on what's going to happen after the election um, and kind of what would be a process for organizations to engage or some of the kind of top three things maybe they should do post election day if they want to um, engage with um, newly elected MPs or ministers in the government? Sure, that's a loaded question, but I'm happy to take it on. I think like when it comes, a lot of the, well, I guess a lot of the things that I would do probably after an election is of course data collection. I think when we look back, we want to see, okay, who got elected, who's kind of already been a friendly with us before in terms of development issues, who's kind of come to pass parliamentary receptions, are they still elected? And if not, then let's look at kind of the new MPs who have done backgrounds in various work that involves development. Maybe they've abroad for a long time, maybe they have a master's in development. Kind of thinking about those types of things, I think would be really helpful to start navigating and maybe making like a tier list of kind of your top people that you think would have the most interest or like a something that they might find um, useful. And then of course, thinking about um, their writings and what areas are they around, or is it, you know, a heavily diverse area, you know, because for example, with an MP formerly I used to work with who represented Brampton area. Um, they did care about what was happening in India because a lot of people were sending money back to their constituent or to their, sorry, to their families and would affect obviously their lifestyle um, back home. So again, like thinking those kinds of things through what areas do they represent. So data information I think is the number one first and foremost thing you should probably do after an election. And of course, just introducing yourself. I think I know it gets a little bit bombarding, especially right after an election to try to meet with you know, a newly elected minister or even a newly elected MP, a lot of them haven't been able to even get their office up and especially a lot of them that takes a while for the emails to get set up. So giving them a minute to kind of breathe and maybe thinking about that after. Um, and of course, every government's different. Some, you know, will I know like in the past, the Trudeau government waited until after the new year, but you know, maybe a new leader might want to get right to work right away. So they might come straight to Ottawa. It really depends. But again, I think just giving some time for the offices to kind of set up phone lines take forever. I remember checking our mail like at a Tim Hortons because we don't have an office yet. So it takes, it takes some time for all those kinds of things. And then they also go through training as well. So it, it, it does take quite some time. So I think just giving yourself some time, which is too, because then you can kind of focus on um, like what Lauren was saying, like some of those parliamentary associations, although you may not know who's sitting on them, you will know that they are there and that once they do assign those kinds of chairs or the, the associations, um, I don't know, like uh, co-chair, then you can definitely certainly figure out who they are and then proceed go through that. So those things you can kind of think about early on and maybe how you can fit into that. So I think those are some kind of like quick things off the top of my head that I would probably be focusing on. And then of course, just being a friendly face and always a resource for all MPs and staff as well. I'd like to point that out that I know a lot of people focus on the MP, but what Lauren said is they are so busy and they are always bombarded by so many things. And oftentimes it was the staff person like myself that would constantly bring something up if I thought that it was important for my MP to focus on. And we really pushed it sometimes with our members to be like, I know we kind of talked about this briefly, but I really think that this statement in the house on World Water Day would be really fascinating to do. I think it works aligned with, you know, some of the work you're doing in committee or whatever it is, and really we should start doing that. So staff is also kind of like your hidden gem in a sense, and it's okay. I know some people feel slighted when they're the MP is not available. So the staff is willing to take the meeting, but I've always kind of been a fan of, you know, understanding that they they do have some sort of level of power in it as well and can often bring it up or make a pitch for it again if they really feel like it's kind of strategic for their own objectives.
Great, thank you. Any other questions? If not, we will move on to our final speaker, Gwyneth. All right, thank you so much. Um, so good morning, everyone, once again. Um, and thank you all for meeting with me on this virtual space. I'm kind of new to the virtual space, so uh, please forgive my greenness if uh, anything goes awry with my uh, comments in the next few moments. Um, I want to thank the uh, Can Watch team in particular for involving me in this uh, and, uh, and for helping me to uh, just speak to more charities and not-for-profits. Uh, I focus the majority of my practice on, on advising charities and not-for-profits on their legal obligations, and it's just an incredibly rewarding area of practice. So it's good fun, as we call it, uh, in social impact here at, at Miller Thompson. Um, so before we get into today's conversation or the presentation, um, I do have an obligation just to note to everyone that this is um, information which I'm sharing and it's not meant to be a legal opinion or advice. Um, it's provided merely for informational purposes and to facilitate just some knowledge for, for you to hopefully gain. Um, further, this information is provided from a plain reading of the law and through our experience with the Income Tax Act and Canada Elections Act. Um, and we do encourage you to seek tailored uh, legal advice um, to the specific facts of your organization's needs um, from experienced legal counsel if you have any specific questions from this important topic today. So as a starting point, um, I do want to be clear in my comments that um, charities and nonprofits or NPOs, as I will call them in this presentation, are, are different types of third parties um, at law. And so as a result, um, the Canada Election Act regulations do apply differently to these two types of, of organizations. So with regards to charities, for the purposes of today's conversation, um, when I say charity, I mean registered charity that is recognized, that has recognized charitable status from CRA. So with this status, um, they become income tax exempt and they can issue official donation receipts, which are of course in compliance with that charity's receiving obligations under the Income Tax Act. A charity must use all or substantially all of its resources or assets, and so that includes the manpower um, of, their, of their people on the ground, their boots on the ground, to fulfill their charitable purposes for which they were granted charitable status from CRA based upon. So they do have limited activities that they can undertake, and that definitely is relevant when we're talking about advocacy act activities during the election period and, and otherwise at other times of the year. Um, these charitable activities may include public policy dialogue and development activities, or as we call them, PADAs, um, just so that it's uh, less of a mouthful, so to speak. Um, they can, PADAs can be carried on in furtherance of the specific charitable purposes to a charity, but they must never be partisan, and that's a really important um, point to emphasize, and I will come back to that again and again today. I do confirm that when a charity is pursuing PADA's um, advocacy that they must maintain a nonpartisan position. If the charity does choose to engage in dialogue that is partisan in nature based upon CRA's um, perception of what they're undertaking, then they would be breaching their requirements under the Income Tax Act and their charitable status may be, may be um, at risk. Now, not-for-profits are different, as I have mentioned. Um, NPOs um, are different than charities. They are not required to register with CRA in the same way that charities do, but they must meet eligibility requirements pursuant to different section of the Income Tax Act in order to gain um, income tax exempt status. Um, however, NPOs, and this is of course a key difference that I'm sure you're intimately aware of, um, they cannot issue official donation receipts as, as charities uh, have the ability to do so. Unlike charities, there are very few restrictions on the activities of um, NPOs. Um, however, they must um, undertake their activities um, in accordance with their own corporate statutes or their constating documents. So that's their articles of incorporation and those types of things. Um, and of course, the one key exception of activities they cannot undertake is they cannot undertake activities that do have a profitable purpose to them. Kind of in the name, so uh, it's, but we have to highlight it, of course. 
Um, so there are definitely key differences between charities and not-for-profits, um, particularly when it comes to advocacy um, during this election period. And especially um, with regards to the potential um, impact of the regulations on the Canada Elections Act. So the Canada Elections Act governs what um, entities or organizations can say and do during an election period campaign. The regulations pursuant to the Canada Elections Act implement a registration and, rep and a reporting procedure specifically for all the organizations when they engage in regulated activities during the election period. Regulated activities are defined in, in the act and so we will kind of unpack that a little bit. This means that if a third party engages in an activity that it is con that is considered a regulated activity and the expenses incurred um, for this engagement exceed 500 Canadian dollars that entity must register with Elections Canada as a third party. If the entity registers with Elections Canada, um, there are reporting obligations that go hand in glove with that registration um, and they would need to be in compliance with the Canada Elections Act um, specifications. However, let's um, spend a few moments kind of unpacking what specific requirements charities and NPOs may have under the Canada Elections Act. In this vein, in order to understand whether or not these regulations impact your organization, it's crucial to kind of understand what a third party is and also what a regulated activity is under the Canada Elections Act. According to this act, a third party is a person or a group that intends to participate in um, or influence elections, but is not a political party, an electoral district association, nomination contestant or candidate. And so for the purposes of today's presentation, a group is broadly defined to include a group of persons who act together by mutual consent and for a common purpose. This is a very, very broad definition and any attempt for a person or group to avoid being considered a third party under this definition would be very un unlikely to be successful. Um, it will include charities and not-for-profits and likely your organization. Therefore, if a person or group wants to avoid registering with Canada Elections Act as a third party and therefore reporting its activities, they should avoid participating in regulated activities as are contemplated in the Act altogether. So jumping into this defined term of regulated activities, um, there are four categories which are defined in the Act and so I hope just shed a bit of light onto this, so to speak. So the first of the four categories are partisan activities. Partisan activities include activities carried out by a third party that promote or oppose a political party, a nomination contestant, a potential candidate, a candidate, um, or a party leader. Um, and they are other than um, by taking a position on an issue with which a party or person is associated. The second regulated activity are election surveys. Um, this includes surveys designed and conducted during the election period, which is where we are presently. Um, and uh, sorry, I'm just finding my place. Um, to determine, and the elections can, or sorry, the surveys can be undertaken by that third party to effectively determine um, whether or not they want to organize or undertake other regulated activities, whether it be particularly advertising. The third um, regulated activity is election advertising. This is defined as a transmission, um, which is a broad definition, so we'll unpack that a little bit, um, of an advertising message to the public during the election period that promotes or opposes a registered party um, or um, the election of a specific candidate. And the fourth category um, is um, partisan advertising. However, this was a relevant definition for regulated activity undertaken during the pre-election period. So it's no longer um, particularly relevant to what we're talking about today as the writ has been dropped. All right. So at this juncture, most clients um, are particularly um, asking two questions if they want to look at the technical application of these rules under the Canada Elections Act. These two questions generally are what costs um, are specifically included in calculating the $500 uh, threshold for registration with Elections Canada, and also what is exactly an advertising message when we're talking about regulated activities pertaining to advertising. 
So the threshold for registering as a third party um, is incurring expenses in the aggregate of $500 or more um, for specific regulated purposes that take place during the election period. Um, regulated expenses, um, they can take on many forms and they actually are outlined pretty heavily in the in the act itself, so that being the Canada Elections Act. Um, in this vein, both monetary and mo non-monetary contributions are actually defined. And so that needs to be taken into the calculation of the $500 threshold. That is, of course, the threshold for registering with um, Elections Canada. Um, with regards to the question that often comes up about advertising message, there's no one specific definition in the legislation for an advertising message. Um, this said, there is a clarification about partisan and election advertising, which happens online through the Canada or through Elections Canada's resources, um, which would be relevant during this election period, election advertising. Such transmissions um, are considered advertising only if they comply with the def definition um, in the Canada Election Act and the respected um, regulated activities, and they have or normally have any placement cost or sponsorships to boost the content. Um, so we're just talking about the placement costs and the sponsorship. So that's really something that can, can tie into um, calculating that $500 threshold specifically. However, ongoing expenses related to creating and maintaining a third party's website oftentimes do not fall within the scope of the placement costs regarding the transmission of, of, of advertising messages online generally is when we're talking about. Furthermore, messages that are sent or posted for free on social media platforms for um, like Twitter and Facebook or messages sent through email or text again for free. Um, or content posted on a third party's website do not necessarily constitute election or partisan advertising for the purposes of the registration um, consistency or, or calculation or, or the determination if you should register with Elections Canada. Right, um, so we kind of unpacked these a little bit um, and, and I uh, I do apologize in some ways that it is technical. Um, I know that I may not be as engaging as the other speakers, but um, the law is what the law is, so uh, that's where we're going right now. <laughs> um, so just to kind of sum things up and hopefully provide a little bit of clarity as to what I'm trying to talk about, because um, we've talked about the Income Tax Act and we've also talked about the Canada Elections Act, and they're both relevant to this conversation, but let's try and make some uh, sum things up a little bit. Um, so provided there is appropriate registration and reporting done, a, an NPO or a not-for-profit who is not also a charity, so we're just talking about NPOs right now, they can undertake regulation, regulated activities um, and still be compliant with their Income Tax Act um, uh, obligations. Um, what this means is that NPOs can undertake what may be partisan or nonpartisan activities. They need to be less concerned about that, that question um, with regards to their advocacy, their messaging, and their transmission of, of, of their messaging during the election period. So they do need to be less concerned from an Income Tax Act perspective. But um, if the not-for-profits do meet the $500 threshold um, in accordance with the Canada Elections Act, they should register um, in accordance with those rules um, with Elections Canada as a third party in order to comply with these legal obligations they may have. Um, of course, there would be um, some registration and some reporting obligations that would kind of go hand in glove with that registration. When we talk about registered charities, on the other hand, I need to be very clear that they should never undertake partisan activities because um, this would be in contravention with their Income Tax Act obligations. They can participate in PADAS um, and there is a guidance um, from uh, CRA on their website which is publicly available if, if charities want to consult that or, or of course speak with legal counsel. Um, so they can participate in PADAS if they are doing so in accordance with their charitable purposes. That's very important what you have been given charitable status based upon um, through the election advertising and election surveys um, on issues during the election period. And I will um, emphasize issues and not partisan activity once again. Um, in undertaking these limited activities for charities, the charity, if it does meet the $500 threshold um, in the Elections Canada Act, it should consider registering with Elections Canada to be in compliance with that act. So that, that's just a plain reading of that. This all said, 
one thing that that we definitely had experience here at Miller Thompson when when advising clients on these types of complex issues is um, honestly just about any advertising message during an election period would likely require registration as a third party um, during election period um, as a third party sorry with Elections Canada. Um, campaigns are wide ranging and they're very partisan and it's easy to be for our clients can become embroiled in rhetoric and, and the question of what is partisan what is not partisan is a very hard question um, to delineate to be honest with you I'm sure you've seen some headlines um, in the news presently about that. Some lawyers that, that, that are, um, do believe that Elections Canada will show some leniency and some exercise some discretion with regards to the application of these rules with Election Canada. Um, but it is a very difficult, um, uh, difficult uh, question to advise on and, and, and um, a very conservative approach is that we would advise no charity or NPO to really put itself in a position where they would be relying on the discretion um, of, a, of a specific bureaucrat within Elections Canada for those for those decisions. Um, as they may find themselves dedicating resources um, to dealing with complaints, audits, and investigations because of a decision not to register with Elections Canada. So there can be some risk associated with choosing not to register. In this vein, if your charity or not-for-profit does not want to register with Elections Canada as a third party, it really should suspend all advertising efforts or regulated activities during this election period. Um, again, this would be a very conservative way to approach this. Um, and in doing so, it would be avoiding the possibility of complaints, audits, and investigations um, related to, to its activities. Um, anyway, in this vein, um, again, I've provided a bit of a technical technical approach to things. Uh, thank you for involving me in the web webinar today. Um, I would be happy to uh, to, to address some questions um, from an information perspective. I can't necessarily provide, and I, and I won't be able to provide an opinion regarding whether something is not a partisan or not, um, um, but, but I'd be happy to address some questions. Thank you so much. Um, and I think you kind of, there was one question in the chat box that I think you kind of just answered, but for those that don't have the video on, it's interested in your take on whether paid advertising for fundraising purposes, but which speak about issues like global poverty, refugees, climate change, et cetera, risk falling foul of the Elections Canada Act. Um, I know you were mentioning if you're engaging in paid advertising for fundraising that better safe than sorry, but maybe you have uh, more to add there. Um, so with regards to paid advertising, um, that is definitely more likely to be considered boosting um, a message of, of uh, an MPO or, or ch our charity. Um, and then when we're talking about registering with Elections Canada, that may fall into the threshold um, more so. Um, I think that that's the other bit of the question. Um, and then with regards to the the other bit of the question relates to um so i'll just i'll just read it so issues like global poverty refugees climate change um i i think i, I mentioned it and I, I i will reiterate this um with regards to whether those types of of topics um which so many charities um, their exclusive charitable purposes are dedicated to to those types of to addressing um to addressing um, matters like that, um, and absolutely, I, I can um, consider that. Um, however, it is very difficult for us to understand, especially with um, what seems to be, be happening with um, with Elections Canada, um, whether or not those types of issues are, are in fact issues, or if they are in fact partisan activities, because. Um, the candidates are speaking about those issues and things of that nature. So um, whether or not a registered charity in particular, and that's really what I'm talking about, whether or not their, um, their activities or their transmissions are, are partisan or they are um, an issue or advocacy for an issue, that's something that would be a bit more difficult to, to navigate. Thank you. And I know it's it's noon, so I think we're pretty much out of time. So I'll turn it to Julia, I think. Sure. I think there's probably many, many questions, uh, uh, Gwyneth, for you, but maybe we can facilitate a follow up uh, if people are sort of thinking, thinking through those. Thank you so much for your presentation and for the other two presentations. I think 
we heard uh, it was a really nice narrative that was built from the kind of experience on the ground of what it's like to be lobbied and engage uh, as a politician to a really practical and congratulations, by the way, results uh, toolkit that's beautiful. And I think will be super helpful to the, the legal ramifications. I think the only thing I would offer is that Ken Watch is uh, your, your partner, you're all our members uh, in this election period. It's our first time as an organization uh, going through this. And so we're really interested to hear in the things that you're running into, how you're navigating uh, the act. If you are seeking out legal counsel on things, let's uh, bring that to the table and have conversations. Because I think the more examples that we can pile up here on like, this is what I did and this is what I heard from my legal counsel, uh, the better we'll be able to navigate next time. And I think it's absolutely critical not-for-profits and charitable organizations are part of the fabric of our democracy. And I would hope that this new act doesn't silence us and take away from our really important role in promoting not only our issues, but citizen engagement more generally. Um, because I think that uh, strong democracies have a strong civil society and that's us, right? And so let's uh, work on this together and come to the table as partners and, and Ken Watch really wants to support you and learn alongside you because as I said, we're learning too. Uh, so reach out with your struggles, reach out with your, um, how, you're, how you're navigating walking through this and then hopefully we can put together a bit of a, a story and a narrative at the end that helps us in the next election as well. And I think also something Gwena said is we have a bit of an opportunity here to norm Elections Canada. So I think we don't want to be afraid to say like this is what worked for the charitable not-for-profit sector and this is what's not working um, because you know the third party legislation was affects us but it's not necessarily us who it was set up to target um, so Ken Watch is happy to take on that role as well to sort of bring back our narrative after this election to Elections Canada and help them think through how they want to be more lenient be more strict and where where they need to go with that. So thanks so much for being here. Such a rich uh, discussion and please uh, follow up with your questions and comments. And thanks to Taryn and Megan for organizing uh, uh, and all the work that you did to put this together. Bye everyone. Thanks everyone.